The reality regarding the visage and skin tone of Jesus will astound you. Was Jesus really as we have known him? Unbelievably detailed on his appearance, Pilate's letter to Roman Emperor Tiberius regarding Jesus deviates from even the Gospels. Along with his trial, crucifixion, and believe it or not, resurrection, he also discusses Jesus' miracles in this letter. But just what does this letter say exactly? What may Pilate have told the emperor regarding the Son of God's physical appearance and resurrection? Pilate starts his letter to the emperor, Tiberius Caesar, with greeting. Majesty, the recent happenings in my province have been so remarkable that I find myself driven to go over everything in great detail since I think these events might influence the destiny of our country. All the gods seem to have lately turned away from us. I almost feel that the day I took over Judea from Valerius was cursed. Ever then my life has been full of problems and anxieties. I assumed command of the Praetorium as soon as I set foot in Jerusalem and laid out a magnificent feast. When the scheduled time came, none showed up, even though I invited a tetrarch from Galilee, the high priest and his officers. This seemed to me as evidence of disdain toward the Roman government and my power. A few days later, the high priest visited me looking grave but dishonest. He asserted that his religion barred him from sitting down to eat with Romans, but his face betrayed that his statements were not honest. I agreed his explanation, but it soon became evident he and his supporters hated the Romans. The Romans should keep alert of the high priests in this area, since they would not hesitate to turn even their own moms into tools for riches and power. Jerusalem is the toughest city among all the ones we have seized to rule. The people are so disobedient that I live in continual anxiety about an insurrection. I have few soldiers, merely a centurion and one hundred men under my command. When I asked the Syrian governor for reinforcements, he told me he hardly had enough to guard his own territory. Our will to grow seems to exceed our capacity to guard what we have already overcome. I worry that finally this could cause our government to fall apart. Faced what the priests could inspire the rebels to do, I have avoided close contact with the people. Still, I have worked to better grasp the attitude and worries of this demographic. Among the several tales I have heard, one really attracted my attention. They related about a young man in Galilee imparting a fresh theology under the name of a god dispatched here. I first assumed he could be trying to persuade the people against us, but I soon discovered that was not the case. Jesus of Nazareth looked to be more palable to Romans than to the Jews themselves. Once, while I was walking across the square, I noticed a sizable gathering around a young man peacefully seated against a tree. Not surprisingly, I discovered it was Jesus, as he obviously distinguished among those listening to him. I chose not to disrupt by my presence. I carried on on my route, but I asked my secretary to listen to what he was saying and blend in with the throng. Manly Manlius, my secretary, is the grandson of an elderly conspirator who years long waited for Catiline in Etruria. He has my whole trust, is devoted to me, and speaks Hebrew really naturally. Manlius reported what Jesus had said when he got back to the Praetorium. In the writings of philosophers, I have never seen anything that could match the wisdom of his statements. Among the few Jewish rebels in Jerusalem, one asked Jesus if it was proper to pay taxes to Caesar. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's, he said. Though I could have arrested him or thrown him into exile in Pontus, that knowledge guided me in releasing the Nazarene. Doing this would have been unfair, as Roman government is based on the core idea of justice. Jesus neither was a rebel nor an agitator. Maybe without him even seeing it, I provided him my protection. Jesus was free to act, talk, assemble with the public, select his students, and instruct free from my intervention. Should the gods prohibit the religion of our forebears to be replaced by that of Jesus? This tolerance will be what brings Rome down, and I, an unlucky tool, will have been part of what the Jews call providence and we call fate. 
the wealthier and more powerful Jews became enraged by the freedom I granted Jesus. Jesus was stern with them. For me, that was sufficient justification to remain free. He would remark to the scribes and Pharisees, You are like serpents, showing up as well-decorated tombs on the outside, but within you are full of death. If you enjoy our content and want to support us, click on the Super Thanks button below. Your Super Thanks is not just a donation. It is a blessing that supports our mission to share the transformative journey of Jesus. On other times, he attacked regional customs, arguing that humility was more important in God's perspective than any social rank. I heard complaints at the Praetorium about Jesus' audacity practically every day. They cautioned me that Jerusalem had a past of stoning persons who claimed to be prophets and that something horrible could happen to him. Though I lacked enough troops to control a possible insurrection, the Senate accepted my policies and pledged reinforcements following the Persian War. A petition to Caesar was under preparation. Then I resolved to act to bring peace back into the city without sacrificing myself. To enable us to discuss, I messaged Jesus requesting him to visit the Praetorium. He stopped by. Being of Spanish and Roman background, you know, I am not really moved or threatened. But I was standing on the balcony when Jesus arrived and thought my feet were fixed to the marble floor. While the Nazarenes stayed quiet with a tranquility that seemed like purity itself, my whole body shook like someone with a guilty conscience. He stopped as he got closer and gestured gently to seem to say, I am here, without needing to speak a word for a long time. This man astounded and delighted me. He is the kind our artists have never envisaged while capturing gods and heroes. Though I felt frail and too elderly to approach, there was nothing about him that turned me off. I said, frightened, Jesus at last, Christ of Nazareth. I do not regret giving you complete freedom of expression over the previous three years. Your comments are logical and wise. Although I'm not sure whether you have read Socrates or Plato, I know your speeches' simplicity and brilliance set you much above these thinkers. The Emperor knows this, and as his agent here, I am happy to have given you the freedom you so fairly deserve. But I have to warn you, your statements have drawn strong and misguided adversaries. Two, Socrates became victim of adversaries. Even more enraged, Yours have turned against you for the ferocity of your comments and against me for letting you express yourself. Some even charge me of plotting with you to diminish the meager civil authority Rome now permits the Hebrews, considering that your enemies may use pride to inspire the uninformed people against you and compel me to act in line with the law, my advice, not a directive, is that you be more cautious and restrained in your statements from now on. Jesus answered coolly, Ruler of the earth, your statements are not from pure wisdom. Ask Mount Tabor to stop midway across the valley. It will respond that it respects the laws of nature and of the Creator God. Only He knows where the rivers run. I am speaking the truth here. The blood of the righteousness will be shed before the rose of Sharon blossom opens. Your blood will not be shed. I said, profoundly moved. More than all these disobedient Pharisees who misuse the freedom the Romans have given them, I respect your knowledge. They discredit Caesar and work against him so the people come to view him as a tyrant aiming for their destruction. Unappreciative men fail to understand that occasionally the wolf hides itself as a sheep in order to fulfill its evil goals. I'll guard you against them. Your night and day will find my praetorium a hallowed haven. Calm as usual, Jesus shook his head and remarked, When the time comes, there will be no refuge for the Son of Man, neither on the earth nor under it. The heavens offer the actual haven. Rising upward, young man, what the prophets wrote will come true. Concerned, I said, you are making me turn my request into an order under pressure. Under my responsibilities, the security of this province needs it. Your speeches should be more careful. You know the repercussions. Thus, do not ignore this sequence. May your pleasure travel with you. 
say goodbye. Said Jesus, Prince of the Earth, I came to bring peace, love, and charity, not disruption. That same day Augustus Caesar brought peace to the Roman Empire, I was born. Though I know I shall encounter many of them because others in compliance with my father's plan have showed me the road to tread. The persecutions are not mine. Thus, restrain your words. You cannot make the victim stay on the altar of sacrifice. After saying this, he withdrew like a light fading on the horizon, which brought me great relief, for his presence was too heavy a burden for me. Herod, who ruled at the time and was already of advanced age, joined Jesus' enemies to seek revenge. If it were up to Herod alone, he would have ordered Jesus killed immediately. But despite his vanity as king, he hesitated to do something that might damage his influence with the Senate. Perhaps like me, he also feared Jesus, but a Roman official could not admit fear of a Jew. Herod came to the praetorium to visit me, and as he rose to leave after a conversation of little importance, he asked me what I thought of the Nazarene. I responded that Jesus seemed to be one of the great sages who sometimes appear in great nations, and that his teachings were not about politics. Therefore Rome had decided to let him speak freely, as his actions did not justify any kind of punishment. Herod gave me a mocking smile, and with a bow full of irony, took his leave. The most important Jewish festival, Passover, was approaching, and there was an intention to exploit the popular unrest that always overtook the city during this time. Jerusalem was crowded with a noisy mob demanding Jesus' death. My informants revealed that the temple's treasury had been used to bribe the people. The danger was near, and a Roman centurion had been publicly humiliated. I sent a letter to the governor of Syria requesting reinforcements, 100 foot soldiers and 100 cavalrymen, but he refused. I found myself isolated, with few veterans in a hostile and rebellious city, without the strength to control a possible uprising, and with no choice but to endure it. Jesus was arrested on the charge of being a rebel, although they knew there was no reason to fear the praetorium. With the support of their leaders, they believed I was covering up the revolt and kept shouting relentlessly, Crucify him! Crucify him! At that moment, three major groups united against Jesus, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. The ambiguous stance of the Herodians and Sadducees seemed to have two reasons. They hated Jesus, but they were also wary of Roman rule. They never forgave me for entering the holy city with banners bearing the image of the emperor. And even though I made a grave mistake on that occasion, to them the sacrilege was still unforgivable. Another conflict was also intensifying among them. I had suggested that a portion of the temple's treasury be used to fund public works, and this idea was deemed unacceptable by the Pharisees, who were already opponents of Jesus. They cared little about the government and harbored resentment due to the harsh criticisms the Nazarene had been making against them for the past three years in every place he visited. In addition to these groups, I was also dealing with the unruly and reckless populace, always ready to join a rebellion and take advantage of any chaos that might arise. Faced with this, Jesus was brought before the high priest and sentenced to death. At that moment, Caiaphas, the high priest, acted in an apparently submissive manner, sending Jesus to me so that I could confirm the sentence and ensure the execution. I replied that since Jesus was from Galilee, the case should be judged by Herod, and I ordered that he be taken to him. Herod, displaying false humility and claiming to respect Caesar's representative, sent the decision back to me, placing the entire responsibility in my hands. In no time, my palace became a besieged fortress, with the number of rebels growing rapidly. Jerusalem was overrun with crowds descending from the mountains of Nazareth. It seemed as though all of Judea was gathering in the city. A Galilean seer who claimed to foresee the future fell at my feet in tears and warned me, Beware, do not touch this man, for he is sacred. Last night I saw him in a vision walking on water, flying on the wings of the wind. He spoke to the storm and to the fish in the lake, 
and they all obeyed him. I saw the river on Mount Catherine fill with blood, the statues of Caesar weep, and the morning sun appeared like a morning virgin. If you do not heed your wife's warnings, a great misfortune awaits you. Fear the curse of the Roman Senate. Fear the thrones of Caesar. At that moment, the marble steps of the praetorium trembled under the weight of the crowd as they brought Jesus back to me. I went to the halls of justice, surrounded by my guard, and firmly asked the crowd what they wanted. The response was unanimous. Jesus' death. What crime has he committed? I asked. He has blasphemed, prophesied the destruction of the temple, and declared himself the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. I replied that Roman justice did not sentence anyone to death for such accusations. However, the shouts of, Crucify him! Crucify him! echoed through the enraged crowd, causing even the palace walls to shake. Among them all, the only one who remained calm was Jesus. After several failed attempts to protect him from the wrath of his enemies, I made a decision that seemed like the last hope of saving his life. I suggested, as was customary during the festivities, to release a prisoner, and I proposed freeing Jesus. However, the people continued to insist that he be crucified. I tried to argue, explaining that their actions were contrary to their own laws. I reminded them that according to Jewish law, no judge could condemn a defendant without first fasting for an entire day, and that the sentence required the consent of the Sanhedrin and the signature of its president. In this court, no execution could take place on the same day the sentence was passed. The following day, which would be the day of execution, the Sanhedrin was supposed to review the entire process. Furthermore, their law required that a man stand at the court's door with a banner, while another, mounted on horseback, proclaimed the condemned man's name, the crime committed, and the names of the witnesses, asking if anyone could testify in his favor. The prisoner on the way to execution had the right to return up to three times to present new arguments in his defense. I emphasized these points, hoping it would calm them, but the cries of, Crucify him! Crucify him! persisted. I then ordered Jesus to be flogged, believing this would be enough, but it only increased their hatred. I asked for a basin and washed my hands before the enraged crowd, declaring that in my judgment Jesus of Nazareth had done nothing deserving of death. However, my words were in vain. Jesus' fate was already sealed. I had witnessed the fury of mobs and civil riots before, but nothing compared to that day. It seemed as if all the spirits from the depths of hell had gathered in Jerusalem. The crowd didn't simply move. They surged in furious waves from the gates of the Praetorium to Mount Zion, with shouts and cries louder than any unrest I had ever witnessed in the disturbances of Pannonia or the Forum. The day gradually darkened like a winter evening, reminding me of what happened at the death of Julius Caesar. Curiously, it was also the Ides of March. As governor of a rebellious province, I stood in a corner of my basilica, watching the grim scene as the innocent Nazarene was led to his execution. Everything around me was deserted. Jerusalem had emptied its people through the dark gates leading to Jamnia. An air of sadness and desolation lingered. My soul connected with Calvary while the centurion struggled to maintain order amidst the chaos. I was utterly alone, and a weight on my chest told me that what was unfolding before me was more a drama of the gods than of men. The sounds of agony echoed from Golgotha, carried by the wind as if announcing a suffering never before heard by human ears. Black clouds gathered over the temple and spread across the city, covering it like a dark shroud with visible signs both in the heavens and on the earth. It is said that Dianus the Patriarch exclaimed, Either the Creator is suffering, or the universe is falling apart. As these frightening phenomena unfolded, a violent earthquake shook Lower Egypt, filling everyone with terror and nearly scaring the superstitious Jews to death. Bazar, a learned Jew from Antioch and a close friend of the Nazarene, was found dead after the earthquake. 
Whether his death was caused by the shock or by grief, no one knows for sure. Near the first hour of the night, I wrapped myself in my cloak and descended into the city, heading toward the gates of Golgotha. The sacrifice had already been consummated, and the crowd, still unsettled, was returning to their homes with a somber air of remorse for what they had witnessed. I also saw my small Roman entourage passing silently, visibly shaken. The standard bearer had draped the eagle with a cloth, a sign of mourning. I heard some Jewish soldiers murmuring words I couldn't understand, while others were talking about miracles the Romans used to associate with their gods. At certain moments, groups of men and women would stop and look toward Mount Calvary as if they were waiting for some kind of sign. I returned to the Praetorium with a heavy heart, climbing the stairs still stained with the blood of the Nazarene. I saw an elderly man kneeling in prayer, surrounded by Romans who were crying. He threw himself at my feet, sobbing deeply. Seeing an old man cry always gets to you, and my heart, already full of sorrow, became even more burdened. We cried together, and it seemed like everyone there, both him and many in the crowd, were on the verge of tears. I had never witnessed anything like it. Those who betrayed, sold out, and shouted against him, those who demanded his crucifixion, vanished like cowards. I heard that some of them washed their mouths with vinegar, a reference to what Jesus had said about the resurrection and the separation of the dead. If it happened, it was there, in front of that enormous crowd. Father, I asked when I finally composed myself, who are you and what do you want? I am Joseph of Arimathea, he replied, and I come to ask permission to bury Jesus of Nazareth. I granted him permission and instructed Melis to take some soldiers to ensure the body wouldn't be violated. A few days later, the tomb was found empty, and the disciples began to say that Jesus had risen, just as he had foretold. This caused even more commotion than his death itself. I cannot say for certain what truly happened, but I thoroughly investigated the matter. You can check personally and decide if I made any mistakes, as Herod claims. Joseph used his own tomb to bury Jesus, but I cannot guarantee whether he knew or had something planned regarding the resurrection. The day after the burial, a priest came to the praetorium, worried that the disciples might steal Jesus' body and make it seem like he had risen as he had predicted and as they strongly believed. I directed the priest to the captain of the guard, Marcus, and ordered him to place as many Jewish soldiers as necessary around the tomb, so that if anything happened, the responsibility would fall on them and not on the Romans. When I heard the news of the empty tomb, my concern grew. I spoke with Marcus, who told me he had assigned his lieutenant Ben Isham with 100 soldiers to guard the site. He reported that Aisham and his men were terrified by the events of that morning. I called for Aisham, who recounted as faithfully as possible what happened. He said that around the fourth watch, a soft, enchanting light appeared over the tomb. At first he thought it was women who had come to embalm Jesus' body, as was the custom, but he didn't understand how they could have passed through the guards. As he pondered this, the entire place was illuminated and he saw what seemed like a multitude of the dead in their burial shrouds, all appearing younger and full of joy, while heavenly music, the most beautiful he had ever heard, filled the air. It felt as though the entire sky was praising God. Suddenly, the earth began to shake violently, and he felt weak, unable to stand as if the ground was moving beneath his feet, and then he fainted, not knowing what happened after that. I asked him how he was when he came to. He said he was lying on the ground, face down. I questioned if he might have mistaken the light he saw for the sunrise in the east. He replied that at first he thought so too, but at a short distance it was still quite dark, and he remembered it was too early for the sun to rise. I asked if the dizziness he felt could have been from standing up too quickly, which sometimes causes that sensation. He denied it explaining that he hadn't slept all night, as sleeping during duty was punishable by death. He mentioned that he had allowed some soldiers to sleep at that time.
and that some were still asleep. I asked how long the scene lasted. He said he wasn't sure but thought it was nearly an hour until the daylight overshadowed it. I asked if he had gone to the tomb after regaining his composure. He responded that he hadn't, as he was afraid, and as soon as reinforcements arrived, they all returned to the barracks. I asked if the priests had questioned him. He confirmed, saying that the priests wanted him to claim it was an earthquake and that the guards had been sleeping. They offered him money to say that the disciples had come and stolen Jesus' body, but he said he didn't see any disciples and only learned of the body's disappearance when he was told. I asked him about the personal opinions of the priests he spoke with, and he told me that some believed Jesus was not an ordinary man, not a human being like others, and that he wasn't the son of Mary as many thought. In their view, he was a figure who had already appeared on earth in other times, such as in the days of Abraham and Lot, and on various other occasions and places. If this Jewish theory is correct, these conclusions seem to make sense, as they align with what we know about the life of this man. Both friends and enemies acknowledge that Jesus seemed to have control over the elements, as if he were a potter shaping clay. He turned water into wine, healed diseases, raised the dead, calmed storms, and even made fish appear with coins in their mouths. If he truly performed all these acts and many others, as witnessed by the Jews themselves, and it was precisely for these reasons that he stirred up so much hostility, it is clear that he wasn't accused of common crimes, of breaking laws, or of directly harming anyone. These deeds are known by thousands of people, both supporters and opponents. I'm inclined to believe, as someone said at the cross, truly, this was the Son of God. Pontius Pilate described Jesus as an impressive figure, distinct from any other. He mentioned that Jesus had an average height, with a calm demeanor and a sure presence that drew the attention of everyone around him. His face conveyed a sense of kindness and peace, even in the most tense situations, and his expression always reflected tranquility. Jesus seemed to look at people with deep compassion, as if he understood them in a unique and complete way. Accounts say that Jesus had long, soft hair that fell harmoniously over his shoulders. His hair was slightly wavy and described as light brown, almost blonde, which set him apart from the people of the region. His eyes were perhaps his most remarkable feature, described as deep and piercing. Some said they varied between light brown and blue, depending on the observer's perspective. His eyes conveyed wisdom and kindness, while also showing a firmness that seemed to understand life and the human heart profoundly. Jesus' skin was described as fair, with a smooth texture like someone who spent time outdoors but still maintained a healthy and well-kept appearance. His face was considered beautiful and symmetrical, with features that inspired confidence and respect. It wasn't just any face, but one that projected authority without appearing intimidating or threatening. He wore a full, well-groomed beard, which added a touch of maturity and respect to his appearance. Jesus dressed simply but always with dignity. His clothes, though modest, were always clean and typically consisted of a long robe and a tunic. He did not wear flashy adornments or jewelry, reflecting his detachment from material possessions. His appearance conveyed a message of humility and simplicity, even with his striking presence. Without needing to speak, he could transmit a sense of peace and welcome. Now, noble sovereign, this is the most accurate account I can provide of the events. I have made every effort to present all the details so that you may judge my conduct fairly, knowing that much criticism has been directed at me in this matter. With loyalty and respect to my sovereign, I remain your most obedient servant. If you enjoy our content and want to support us, click on the Super Thanks button below. Your Super Thanks is not just a donation, it is a blessing that supports our mission to share the If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel right now. Click on the video appearing on your screen to discover more mysteries like this.